Danny and I met our senior year at BYU. I got involved in student government and had been elected as vice president of finance. Danny was uh, a cheerleader, actually called a flag twirler at the time, and it was coincidental that we had planned a trip for the pep squad and the uh, student government to go down to the BYU, Arizona State, and Arizona basketball games. So. We went to the hotel, checked in, went out to the pool, and we're sitting there by the pool, and Tanny looked down at my feet, and she says, where did that come from? So I had scars on the tops of both of my feet because I had had uh, Hodgkin's disease. So I had these incisions in the tops of my feet, and that's where they would put in the needle and then infuse the radioactive dye that would go through my lymphatic system. So I told her about that and I said, that's not the only one. Let me show you some other scars. It was a great pickup line. And so I walked up to her and said, how would you like to go out, to go for a ride and then go out to dinner? And she said, I'd love to. I kissed her that first night, as I recall. And we got into the cowboy bar and we were dancing and everything. And then she kind of jumped and looked at me and I said, what was that? She said, did you just pinch me? I said, no, I didn't pinch you. To this day, she still would tell you that I pinched her, but I didn't. So that was our first date. We spent a lot of time together talking about things, talking about dreams and hopes. Uh, we would go to church together, and so I would take her hand and I would take a pen and I'd write on her palm, garnish. And that was from the scripture, let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. <laughs> so that became kind of a, a slogan of ours while we were dating. Her father was from uh, Star Valley, Wyoming, and her mother from Granger. So she'd grown up around people from uh, farming communities. But of course, being in uh, California, they were like royalty back there. My parents were different. They came from really different backgrounds. So my mother was a registered nurse and a flight attendant for United back in the day when you had to be a uh, registered nurse to be a flight attendant. And my dad was raised in Urbana, Illinois. Uh, we moved back there after World War II. He was involved in the hotel business and very well thought of. I remember one night we sat and parked for a long time, probably till about four in the morning, and we were just talking about things, talking about family and having eternal families. I know she uh, came to me one day and said, I just got a, an offer to teach school in, in California. You, should I take the offer? And I said, no, don't take the offer. And she said, well, why? I said. Just don't take the offer. So I was trying to I was trying to get up the courage to pull the plug and ask her to marry me. Uh, in fact, I think the way I, way I put it was, hey, how would you like to go out and live with me in Indiana? And she said, are we getting married? I said, yes, of course. So that was how we made the jump. When Tanya and I were first married, we knew that family was important. There was no question about that. I'm not sure we fully understood it, but we knew it was important. Janie was always a little bit of a challenge. She picked up everything from our, the kids in the neighborhood, and I'd been called as branch president. And one day, a member came to me and said, President Radabaugh, I think you need to talk to Janie. And I said, what's the matter? 
He says, well, Janie's going around calling everybody little effers. And I thought, what? And she'd picked that up from some of the kids in the neighborhoods. She and Amber were a lot of fun growing up, but such different personalities. And Amber, who's very mild-mannered, also had a temper. I think I cured Amber of it when I put her in the shower and turned the cold water on. And uh, she began to settle down. Amber had always trouble with her jumpy leg, and so many a night I would sit in the rocking chair out in the living room and I'd hug her while she was kind of whimpering, trying to get to sleep, and I'd rock her to sleep. When Melanie was born, we told Ryan, Ryan, you have a new baby sister. And he just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed because he wanted a brother so bad. And he got a baby sister. When we moved to BYU, then we had Ashley and Kevin. So the last two were born there. I really loved my time at Penn State. In fact, that was the best decision I could ever have made because it was such a good school. So we went to uh, Penn State and started working with a guy named John Daniels, the one who hired me. And John came to me one day and said, would you like to uh, write an international business book with me? And I said, sure, I'd love to. So he had another co-author, but the co-author wasn't doing his work, and so I took over his co-author spot. And we began a very long relationship together of writing and doing different research projects. Um, and we're still working on it up to the 17th edition. When I started my career at BYU, I was in the School of Accountancy, but I was trying to develop an international business program. I got a call from uh, a friend from Scotland, University of Glasgow in Scotland, and he said, we're trying to internationalize our accounting program here. Can you recommend somebody to help us do that? And I said, well, how about me? And in the meantime, uh, he talked to me and he said, look, he said, there's a conference going on in Amsterdam. You really ought to come to it with me. So I did, and I went to that conference with him. and it just totally changed my whole view of the world, going to that conference and listening to people from country all over Europe talk about their challenges. One of the best trips we ever took together was when um, we had to set up an executive MBA program in Asia. And so I took Tani with me because we could do this in a week. She went out to the Great Wall by herself in a taxi uh, to see the Great Wall for the first time. And she was always doing stuff like that because she had a sense of adventure. And then I went to India, and the one that always stuck in her mind was the National Anthem of India. So we got on the bus, and I said, okay, now my wife's gonna sing you the National Anthem. And the guy who was our guide couldn't believe it, nor could the bus driver, and so she just launched into it and sang the, the Indian National Anthem, and they were just blown away. And so, um, obviously, as is always the case, she was a hit on the trip. I wasn't able to take all of the kids with me on international trips, and that was unfortunate. I wish I'd done a better job of that, but we um, had a lot of fun things to do around here, and the ranch, of course, was the key when in Grover. The folks bought that in 1970, and all we had was one little house down there, a little blue house, and the kids, of course, were all small. Babies were taking baths in the sink and that kind of stuff. And we really had a lot of fun with the ranch. But of course, gradually, we all outgrew it and we had to build another house. 
that was a place for the family to all come together. And because the family was relatively small, we could all come down at the same time. And that's where the cousins got to know each other. They became very close, all of them. So when we moved to Pennsylvania, we began to learn a little bit more about what the church meant in our lives. And one of the things that really made a big difference to me was when Hugh Pinnock was called to be the mission president in Pennsylvania. But I learned from him the concept of being church broke. And I didn't understand that term right away, but church broke means you do what you're asked to do. But I got a phone call one day, and it was from Elder Nelson's office. At that time, he was a member of the Twelve. And the secretary said, Elder Nelson would like to meet with you and your wife. Would you be able to come up here? And I said, sure, when? And she told me. I felt like somebody hit me in the stomach because I knew it was September, October, which is the time that they often will interview people to be mission presidents. So I went up there, and he sat us down and started interviewing this great guy. He was a wonderful man. He says, I can't call you to be a mission president. That comes from the prophet. But I'm going to recommend you be called now while your health is good. Then we left, and we were both pretty stunned by that. So then about uh, another month later, I was out of town on another trip. And that's when Kevin got the phone call, and it was from Elder Faust. And he said to Mom, what does Elder Faust's secretary want with Dad? So Tanya and I drove up Salt Lake. President Faust interviewed us. He didn't interview us. He just said, hey, you've been called to serve in a Portuguese-speaking mission, and we don't know where yet. You'll get the actual call in um, February. So that's when we went and told Tanya's parents, and we came home and met with the kids and told them. Amber, I think, was mad. She didn't want us to go. <laughs> Everybody had different views of it, but uh, it was kind of exciting. We loved Brazil, Tanya and I loved Brazil. I thought it was gonna be just a lot of fun, working with the missionaries, working with the members, getting back to Brazil. I never in my wildest dreams realized how tough it was gonna be. And it was really hard on a number of different levels. We loved those kids uh, to no end, those missionaries, and they really loved Tanya. Even Elder Anderson mentioned that in her funeral letter that uh, people in Brazil love her and know how much she loves them, and that was the way Tani is. Tani and I were called to serve in the Missionary Training Center in a branch presidency. And we went in for our interview, and the member of the MTC presidency said to Tani, now, I know you probably have a call in your ward or your stake, and so if you don't want to come up with your husband, that's fine. She said, are you kidding? I said, I'd be like a kid in a candy store being around missionaries. I'm going to be with them every minute. And she was, and that was not true of most wives. I don't know what I would have done without her. We just worked together closely through that whole period of time. And then she went in for a um, mammogram. I was working at the MTC, and she called me, and said uh, she'd gotten the final word that it, it was malignant and she was going to need surgery. And that just uh, devastated me. I mean, I just broke down. It really hit when she started chemotherapy. And when she started it, and, and they said, OK, and they started giving it to her, I looked at Tanny and said, well, here we go. And so Tanny was doing pretty well. Uh, she was still tired and yet she never stopped serving other people, uh, which is, that's what the Savior does. I mean, she was a perfect example of how the Savior lived his life. I 
had no question that we were married for eternity. I mean, that's the way we started it, and we've always felt that way. Ups and downs, but we always knew that was what was going to happen. I think our time together at the MTC solidified that in ways that are kind of hard to express, but it, it's, it's true. And so um, that was strength that carried us through. Life's a journey, and we learned that, and, and our journey has been fantastic. When your eye is fixed on the fact that we are going to be together forever, then you ride through the things and you realize that it doesn't make any difference because it's going to work out in the end and you just, you're going to make it work. If there's anything I hope everybody knows is how much I love Tanny. I feel I've been really blessed and I love the kids. Every night I tell the Lord how appreciative I am for my children and grandchildren. He's probably getting tired of hearing that, but that's just the way it is because I feel that way. I just hope all of you have the same degree of happiness that I've had. 